It was a terrifying silence. Kill <laughs> 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 that <laughs> um, So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome to Torton House. Um, lots of familiar faces and some new ones too. Uh, so for those of you who haven't been here before, a uh, very warm welcome. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. Um, my name is Kim Simpson. I'm the Deputy Director, so I look after academic programmes here. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our speakers uh, this evening. So we have Professor Elaine Hobby, uh, who is the author of a book called Virtue of Necessity, which was a uh, fundamental reading for anybody uh, doing uh, um, 18th century women's writing, women's life. Um, the same year that that was published, 1988, saw the inception of her very happy career at Loughborough University. Um, and she's now uh, what academics call retired, um, which means uh, that she's wholly free to complete uh, work on a rather mammoth task. Uh, so she's the general editor of the Cambridge edition of Afrobend's works. Then we have Charlotte Cornell, who's a PhD student at the University of Kent. Uh, her thesis concentrates on Afrobend's Canterbury childhood. Before going back to study, Charlotte taught English and drama at the King's School in Canterbury and Eton College before that. Um, Charlotte always found it shocking that Ben, who is so pivotal uh, in terms of women's writing, featured so little on the school level curriculum. So uh, the Rover only in recent years appears to be taught at A level. And Afrobend's sort of been increasingly taught at university level, but nothing before that. Um, so frustrated with this, uh, Charlotte set up the charity A is for Afra uh, to promote Afrobend. So I suppose we should probably start at the very beginning. So Charlotte, could you tell us a little bit about Afrobend's early life? Sure. So um, some of you will have uh, read some Ben, but she went out in her lifetime to not be entirely clear about where she was from and how she'd come to London. Um, she was born Afra Johnson in 1614. And Johnson, of course, clearly a very English name. One of the questions we get a lot, oh, Afra, that's very unusual. Well, it's not that unusual in 1600s Kent. Um, Afra was the name of a Germanic saint, and that, that name came along with traders who traded up the River Stour. So uh, along Kent, uh, increasingly uh, rarely as you go westwards, you get the name Afra pop up a lot. And it's still being seen in baptismal uh, registers until the 1800s, when it does fade from popularity. So actually, Afra Johnson in 1640 sounds not only very English, but extremely Kentish. <laughs> uh, and uh, she would have seemed a really local name. Oh, that's Afra Johnson. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, not strange sounding at all to Canterbury ears in 1640. She's born to Bartholomew Johnson and his wife Elizabeth Johnson. They are respectively, at that point, a would-be barber uh, and possibly a wet nurse. Um, and they are living when Afrobend is born in Harbledown, which is a tiny little village just outside of Canterbury. It's on the old Watling Street. And indeed, it's the last venue for Chaucer's pilgrims. And there, there would have been a, a few different coaching inns, a smattering of houses. There were some arms houses and two churches. So a, a lovely little village. But it's very clear that Bartholomew Johnson, in my research, is desperate to move to Canterbury. The Harble Down life is not for him. Uh, one of the reasons the Harble Down life might not be for him is that the uh, vicar at the time of the Harble Down was Richard Culmer, who was a sort of firebrand, reforming Protestant. In fact, Richard Culmer later uh, takes to the destruction of Canterbury Cathedral. Um, he is Cromwell's chief destroyer of the antiquities of Canterbury within the cathedral. But just before then, he is preaching at Harbour Down. He is all fire and brimstone. And at exactly the same time, Bartholomew Johnson is found drunk in the street on a Sunday <laughs> and is brought before the local magistrate. And in the justice records, I find again and again and again evidence of Bartholomew Johnson, as Dr. Ben's father, being drunk, being incapacitated, assaulting others, trespassing on others. We had this discussion on the way down, and Elaine said to me, "Well, it's quite you know, quite usual at the time for people to be bringing debt cases against their neighbours, and it is, you know, low level debt. The economy is based entirely on debt. Um, it's how the world works, and even your very established, you know, property owners in the seventeenth century are always being brought up for debts they hold to other people. But Bartholomew Johnson is different. In the years that the Johnsons live in Canterbury, 
He is probably the most common name for debt and trespass in the entire justice record. <laughs> He's, so that's the family she's in. Um, he applies quite a few times to become a barber to the city. He, he clearly has been brought up possibly as an <coughs> apprentice elsewhere uh, in the barbering trade. Uh, but the city don't want to give him his freedom. And actually, it's not surprising when you look at the justice records and see what he's doing in his spare time. Um, eventually, he gets his freedom as uh, not as barber, but as an innkeeper. Uh, so he is, uh, he is <laughs> he's an innkeeper. Uh, and I have found where they lived um, in Canterbury. You can't see it because the Germans destroyed it in 1942. But you can see where it was, which is a, a really a lovely part of old Canterbury um, in the St Margaret's parish of the city, which is right in the middle. Um, a really urban and quite poor end. It is the brewery pub, gritty end of the city at, at that time. Uh, it's a, probably the second most impoverished ward. Um, you can sort of tell by the plague records where the poverty is. Um, and the, so that's where they are. Is her mother at the same time working as a wet nurse to the wealthy coal company? who are linked Strangfords, who are a branch of the Sydney's, possibly. Um, it's certainly what someone else claims in his own writings. Um, and that might explain how she comes to write, uh, how she comes to translate French. At the time that she was born, Canterbury's population was one quarter French. So the Huguenot refugees had been given safe sanctuary in Canterbury by Elizabeth I. The entire crypt of the cathedral was dedicated to their worship. And uh, Canterbury, a city of around 7,000 people, had up to 2,000 French-speaking Huguenots. She's heard it her entire childhood, and no doubt as an adult goes out to her farm, her own French cafe, um, is, my, is my feeling. Does she learn the English writing skills from some link to the Culpepper's? Perhaps. Is her mother already literate because her mother's from a sort of fallen branch of aristocracy? Um, uh, these are questions that I, I don't know, and maybe scholars will come up in the medieval history will do it. Um, but that's what I've been working on, trying to dig out the truths and the lies. Because, of course, only a hundred years ago, people thought Ben was from Y, but she came from a family called the Amos family. Um, all kinds of strange assertions that now I'm looking at it. See, are, are wrong. Beta Sackville West claimed she was an Amos because she went looking for an Afra fallen wife. <laughs> That's a mistake. Because baby Afra Amos was born in 1640. Baby Afra Amos would have died in 1640. <laughs> <laughs> but no one checked the burial entries when they got so excited about, about a baptismal find. And I suppose one of the things you learn about archival research is. You, if someone's already said it's true, go back and check. Um, check widely around that document. So if you're looking for certain years, I'm looking at the years, I suppose, 1637 and 1660 particularly, extend it by five or ten either which way. Um, because otherwise you'll miss things. And if you're checking your church records for baptisms, check the bands, mariners and deaths as well. And the accounts, if they've been there. So... So it seems like a lot of the work that is being done in her early life then is, is kind of um, myth-busting in yeah. some ways and, yeah. and going back and checking. I mean, are, are there things that... So there's this question about um, Suriname, for example, yeah. which comes later. I mean, is that is that sure? What do you think about her travelling, potentially travelling to Suriname? So she writes about this in a, a, yeah. a, a novella called I wonder if we think the same thing, and we'll see in a second, but I, we probably disagree. We, disagree. <laughs> we have great car journeys, I've decided, <laughs> where we disagree for two hours on points of day, and occasionally politics, and then we go back to talk about lunch. <laughs> um, uh, the reason they leave Canterbury, I must say, is because her father is eventually imprisoned for a large debt, and such is the debt that he petitions Cromwell for his release from jail, directly. I am making a supplement that one of the conditions of his release from jail is that he leaves Canterbury. The debt is huge, the shame is huge, they can't continue their school to London. And um, uh, Karen Strickland, another uh, researcher, found uh, a couple of years ago now records for their arrival in St. Baltic's Orgate in the east of London in 1657. Uh, she finds entries in the band's registers for the 
perhaps a, an early marriage, a first marriage of academia that may or may not take place. And certainly the bands are watching. Um, so they move to the east of London. Does Afra marry after that? Maybe. And then why go to Suriname? Well, or does she not go to Suriname? So I think, ready for our first argument? <laughs> I think she probably does go to Suriname. I think she probably would. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I think she probably does is that in her own day, I think there would have been enough people to dispute the fact that she that she claimed to have been there. She, she told the story a lot. <laughs> she, she held court about it in pubs. She spoke she about it when she was writing. After she died, people said that she well. died. <laughs> See how it goes. Yeah. So, 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 so exactly with that first is absolutely what, what Charlotte's doing with all this new I have research. I'm coming in from the other end. Because where where I'm coming from is the writings. And the first thing that is clear to me is that a lot of what people have said about Afro then in the last 30, 40 years comes from a desire for who Afro Ben, who I want Afro Ben to have been. <laughs> Because she's, you know, first professional woman writer, and so let's invent her with a history that we wanted to have. Um, and the, added to the complication, of course, women can't really be creative, can they? And therefore, when a character in an afro ben story says, "I was raised a Catholic," hmm. "I was uh, intended to be a nun," or "My father was going to be the director, was going to be governor of five islands in, uh, in the Caribbean, mm. you'd rather that's Afro Ben. She couldn't possibly be making up a story yeah. that makes the, the fiction credible. And so a lot of the things that are said about Ben, um, to me, are not convincing because they are things that need to be true of the narrator or of the character in her work. And in fact, when I used to teach, I used to, to start by explaining to my students that Afro Ben was a juniper tree. Uh, which I can prove. Uh, she has written this poem in the voice of a juniper tree. And, and the juniper tree is extremely convincing. And it's about what happens when two lovers come and lie underneath it and use its root as a, as a pillow. She manifestly is writing for personal experience as a juniper tree. Um, so I, I'm, and also, I mean, as Charlotte is indicating, enormous numbers of people, of course, especially in London, but right across this island, involved in the slave trade mm -hmm. and, and involved in all the spin-offs from that. So the circles that she would be moving in in London, lots of people either have family who live in Suriname or you know elsewhere in that part of the, of, of the country, were writing letters home, mm -hmm. were having conversations about what they learned from this and that family member. Loads and loads of ways to learn the kind of very realistic detail that gets into the story of Olympia. And the, the assertions that that she spoke um, about it, that she wrote it in a pub, that she spoke aloud and mm -hmm. told the story many times before she wrote it, all of that is from a posthumous mm -hmm. biography that's written on probably seven years after she dies by a man who is actually starting to make money from her reputation mm -hmm. and from her work. And he makes up a story that people would want to hear. But that doesn't mean to say that it's true. But it doesn't yes. mean to say that it isn't true <laughs> either. I suppose we're getting slightly ahead of ourselves because mm -hmm. this is a novel that's published in 1688. Mm -hmm. But anyone who hasn't read it, it tells the story of uh, an enslaved African prince. She creates a narrator who is a typical white woman who thinks that she's having a really tough time. Um, and the, to, to my reading, the most extraordinary thing about Arunico, and that's how she spelt it, so I think that's mm -hmm. how she wanted it said. Uh, the most extraordinary thing to me about Arunico is that she does with the story something akin to what she does as a playwright. So if you go into a play, you've got different characters on the stage, you're speaking from different positions, it's up to you as an audience member to make what sense of it you will. I think after then, when she turns her hand to writing fiction, um, invents, she, no, we, we don't have any of the modern fiction writing stuff, but she invents a fiction in which the voice that tells the story, which is the narrator, um, is another character in the story who you can't trust. And if you, every time 
and this is literally the case. Every time the narrator, this nice young white woman in the Rune play, speaks about herself, something appalling has just happened in the story, mm -hmm. which Afra Ben, the author, has written. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, and as we all know happened, a Rune has just had his name stolen. They've renamed him Caesar. Um, so he, he's lost his identity. Uh, and then in comes the narrator. She tells you that she's really having a, a hard time. Mm. Um, after Runico leads the slave uprising, and uh, Ben describes to us, you know, the narrator describes to us how he's whipped mm. and has pepper rubbed into his wounds. Mm. The narrator says, you know, I really wasn't feeling very mm. well. <laughs> you yeah. get over yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and because the narrator also says these things about him, the narrator says the worst thing that happens to Runico is that he that he only had a woman to record his story. And people have cited that as if that is Afro Ben's position. Mm -hmm. When Afro Ben has described these appalling sufferings, you know, what he's done, what he's intended to do. Anyway, she so, just doesn't like the narrator. She really doesn't. And, and, you know, she sets her up. There's no <laughs> way that her father was the governor of seven and forty yeah. islands. By the way, no one is making Bartholomew Johnson governor anything. <laughs> <laughs> he can't hold on to the tenancy of the pub that they have in the, in the early fifties. So that's absolutely not true. Yeah. So you start from the point of view of the narrator is not liked by the author, yeah. and a quasi fact about a potential father is absolutely not going to happen. And how much of the rest of it is true? But I think there's there's that danger of kind of biographical readings, mm -hmm. um, which I think you've uh, shown very clearly. But are there moments where we do get Afrobent's voice? And I'm thinking specifically, I was going to ask about the plays mm -hmm. and about the reception. Um, so Afrobent starts off, uh, well, mm -hmm. sort of making money writing plays. Mm -hmm. um, and she has this preface <coughs> to uh, The Lucky Chance, um, where she has a go at the, at the critics. Um, and really, in a very kind of feisty way, um, sort of lays into them for uh, accusing her plays of being bawdy. And she says, "Well, you know, men men have uh, have written the same thing, um, and just because I'm a woman, I'm being sort of criminalised for it." And um, so, I wonder, is that you think that that's yeah. that's her? But by eighty six in my life, this is the end of her career, right? You know, so she's first she's first writing for, for print for, for the stage and print in sixteen seventy. Mm -hmm. And she dies in 89. So by 86, with, the, with lucky chance, although she doesn't know that she's going to be dead in a couple of years, actually, she's going to be dead in a couple of years. But you're absolutely right that in prefaces and dedications and those sorts of texts, you have a Ben voice. So, right as early as the third play, the, the Dutch Lover, she says that this play bombed. Hmm. And she says partly because the man who was playing one of the key comic parts, refused to learn his lines and just came on and said whatever he felt like. <laughs> um, uh, but partly, she says, I, you know, just before the, before the play started, um, I could hear, and she describes this disgusting white-faced man um, in funny clothes, down in the pit. Uh, and she says, she, everyone could hear him say it, it's going to be a dreadful play because it's a woman's. Mm -hmm. so, and that's her third play, that's the right at the beginning of her career. So I think, and, and, and then with Rover, which is four years later, 1677, extraordinarily successful play. And with Rover, it is on stage every season for 50 years. That's how successful she was. And when I say every year for 50 years, we have almost no records in, in, in Ben's lifetime of what was on the stage. Once you get to 1702, the theatres start to advertise in the newspapers what's going to be on. And both the Rover and the Empire of the Moon are on every season until well into the 1640s. And also the Southern's adaptation of Rinoco yeah. runs for the same period of time, although that does take great liberties with the original text. Yeah. But, but you're not going to be in a situation where people are suddenly playing their play every season, yeah. every, you know, if they haven't just been doing that for the last 25 years, you know. So a fantastically successful play. Um, and at the end of it, there's a little postscript uh, which opens, this play had been sooner in print had it not been for a rumour about the town, which was Thomaso altered. And Thomaso was a play by uh, Thomas Killigrew, who actually is the proprietor of the, of the rival theatre company. And um, she goes on to say, that, that 
Well, <laughs> anyone would like to read Thomas so they can see to what extent my face comes up. It's brilliantly <laughs> different. Um, but she also says that the critics really like to, to, to do playwrights down. Mm -hmm. And then there are some copies of the play where the postscript is expanded at that moment. Mm -hmm. And when talking about um, the critics liking, liking to do down playwrights, she adds the phrase, especially ourselves, mm -hmm. when talking about, about playwrights. Mm -hmm. And my hunch is that those copies, the especially of our sex copies, are ones that she gifted mm -hmm. to people, because there are also copies that have her name on the title page, mm -hmm. whereas it was published without her name on the, on the title page. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm sorry, it's a very long way around answering the question, but yeah, from the beginning, I, I would say, also most clearly in, uh, and, uh, in the Rover, so long in her career before Lucky Chance, she knows where she stands, mm -hmm. and she knows that part of them, where there's a negative response to her is, as a woman. Do, do you have a sense of why she started writing plays? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, the, the, so goes the line, uh, which we can just, you know, yeah, I think Elaine's right. Uh, I, you can't, if you're a writer, you can't ever write. Mm -hmm. And she was almost certainly writing for many, many years before her 16, 17 outing. Mm -hmm. um, she had to also, she, she says, you know, I, I, I had to write for bread, I'm not afraid to own, to own it. She has to write for money, and one of the first big money issues is she has a life debt, a debt book. Mm -hmm. We need a scholarship, I think, to prove money on this debt, which is which asks some women pay their spying debts from time spent in Hamburg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so potentially then she's a she's a spy. Um, oh, she's definitely a spy. Well, she's, she was okay. a spy. The spying letters okay. exist. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's so her being let down then by Charles II, yeah. who doesn't pay her. But she remains a royalist through her life. It, I mean, do we know this? Well, or sort of. What are her politics? What? As, I mean, some people here will, will know perfectly well that um, what you've got when you turn monarchy is a, a sort of compromise and a promise to allow people to believe what they believe, followed almost immediately by persecution. Of anybody whose views are too radical. Um, and when she published the, the, the Rover, the Ro anyone who knows the Rover will, will know that it, it's showing us the antics of a group of cavalier men. And actually, it's set in the 1650s and it's showing what the cavaliers were up to during the interregnum. And it's scandalous. <laughs> they're getting drunk and they're raping them and they're trying to. Um, for some reason, which I put it to my mind, and that's what I wrote. Char James II, or the future James II, the Duke of York, seemed to have thought that the play was a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and my hunch, it's a bit more than a hunch, is that this is actually her entree. So if you look at the plays before the Rover, especially the first couple of plays, they are really very critical of the uh, morality and behaviour of the royalists um, in various ways kind of, uh, you know, disguised or made up for by lots of dancing in the plays, this sort of thing. But if you look at what they're showing about royalists, they're a nasty piece of work. Uh, the Rover, I can't see how anyone could have seen, but they could, they did, seen the play and not seen, but it was really not very complimentary. But they thought it was, <laughs> and new audiences went to see it every season for the next few years. Yeah. Um, and then two years later, she dedicates, she writes the first dedication, uh, which is uh, the play Frank Courtesan, which again takes up sort of women who are courtesans, yeah. and she dedicates it to Nell Gwynn. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and I, so by then, I think she's she's clearly she's met Gwynn, and through Gwynn, by then has got two royal children. Is living in a house in Carlisle that she bought for cash because you know <laughs> Charles just gave her a, a lot of cash all the time. Basically, she's very wealthy, and and Ben says to to Gwyn, um, you, uh, I, I'm sorry, it's taking so long to write your play. I guess, and this is what I'm thinking that, that therefore it's kind of it's maybe the rover that's the thing that produces it. Um, and I think then she's trapped in a way because this is how she's making her living. 
these are the people supporting her. And so come the exclusion crisis, 78, 81, when we're going to allow an overt Catholic onto the throne in a country that believes the Catholic monarchs are dangerous, they look across the sea, they see Louis XIV, they see you know, essentially the, the growth of individual monarchical power. Uh, and so there's huge opposition to James coming to the throne. What, whilst a whole load of people who believe in a country for the Tories, like them, um, support James's right to come to the throne. Um, and I now believe that a fundamental part of why she is so in favour of James coming to the throne is that she thinks it's God's will. So God has chosen that Charles has no legitimate children. And God has allowed James to be a Catholic. And James is, is the successor. And then it has to be okay. It has to be in God's plan. God's plan. And then once you get to the late play, so the lucky chance, as you said, uh, the Emperor of the Moon, which is my favourite play after the road, and maybe you said more about around that anyway. Um, she dedicates those last plays to men who are long-standing Tories, with long-standing royalist families, who have left James II on the throne because they can't swallow the Catholicism that's going on. And I think she's positioning herself very clearly uh, against the direction of, of Charles. And then, of course, she dies. Yeah. Um, it shows her own shifting politics. Mm -hmm. She isn't a fixed, um, mm -hmm. not necessarily a fixed believer in anything. I was, I was actually going to ask about that. So um, we could talk a bit about some of the other genres that Athelon is writing in. But also, are there particular kind of threads or themes that you see playing out through them? Yes. I mean, you, across multiple. In her in her plays, you see constant refrains, which actually, when we come to discuss the statues, some of the sculptures pick up on and use the refrains of disguise, of movement, of escape, um, of confusion, and uh, clothing swaps. And there's young women escaping forced marriages in three or four years. That's more. <laughs> so there are those threads of common themes. Especially in the plays, um, but and, and there's also a really, I think, profound exploration of sexual desire mm. and what it what it would mean, what it meant to her, to women around her, to live in that culture. Because we're talking about a culture that believed that women were more sexual sex, mm. that women had got insatiable mm. sexual appetites. Mm. That, that once a woman has been married, if she's widowed, she can't help herself, you know, want any man around her. Um, but also, of course, you know, that there are lesbian women, there are women who desire other women, and she, she writes about this, of course, as well. But it's a culture that believes that women are hugely and highly oversexed and has absolute rules of control in it. So all women must be virgins until they're at the very least engaged, preferably married. They must then be sexually faithful to their husbands. And what you have in her plays especially, but actually across the different genres, again and again, is the problem of the woman who, for instance, is a widow and is drawn to a man, but um, knows that he's only after sex and nothing more, and she's not doing that. Um, but, and she gives her women the most extraordinary speeches where they you know, soliloquies about how it feels to be in this position of actually being drawn to someone but knowing that they're just going to lift you up, really, and what can I do about that? And I think that recurs and recurs. Of course, that explicit sexuality as well is one of the reasons for her cancellation. Yes, we should talk. We mm. should talk about what happens to her. Um, so, I mean, she's writing plays, she's writing kind of early novels, mm -hmm. and she's writing poetry as well. Possibly the earliest uh, novels, <laughs> yes, the first novel. Um, I don't know, it looks like she might disagree. I don't, with I don't, I don't disagree. <laughs> I, I could give you a disposition on it, but no, possibly is, is fine. <laughs> well, it depends when you find novels. So, 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 yeah, she's writing in these multiple genres. Incredibly professional, and then what happens after after she dies? Um, because her works, I mean, we've got um, 
uh, work from the sort of 1720s editions of her works, which are clearly still being printed. Yeah. Um, but then afterwards, what, what, what happens to her? Well, morality shifts. <laughs> Nothing is stable. And it isn't a constant march forward to liberalism. Mm -hmm. I think really? <laughs> shocking as this may be, even to our American, maybe especially to our American friends at the moment. <laughs> um, I think we see a good example of that of what's happening at the turn of the century between the 17th and the 18th centuries and the first 50 years of the 18th century. We were discussing earlier when that turning point is. Um, and somewhere in the first 50 years of the 18th century, women's, certainly opportunities for women to be public figures it is rolled back. And exposing yourself as a writer is seen as, in, as to be as indecent as exposing yourself would be. So for a woman to put herself on the public stage, to write for the public stage, it begins to be considered filthy and immoral, especially if the play is compared to any element of that. So you do have women writers who are being much, much more careful in the early years of the 18th century. Um, do you want to tell me the, uh, um, the story of the, uh, the mother-in-law? Is it the mother-in-law who writes asking for a copy of Mrs. Burns' work to present her? That's an old grand aunt. Yes. That, that's Sir Walter Scott's yes. story. It's a letter he writes to Lady Louisa Stewart, um, in which uh, he, he tells the story um, about uh, one day going to see his old grand aunt. Mm. And he's writing this in the 1820s, I think it is. And it's about something that happened some time before that. And he says that his, his great aunt asked him if, he, if he'd come across Mrs. Ben's writings. And he says that he, he said to her, well, I don't think she's quite appropriate. You know? <laughs> and she says, well, I want to read, I want to read some. And he says he brought us brought us some. And then the next time he saw her, she returned to him, Mrs. Ben, that puppy brown paper, and suggests that he puts her on the fire. Yeah, ever see that again. <laughs> yeah. And, and but she then says to him, isn't it extraordinary that as a young woman, I listened to her read aloud in the best circles, and now my personal taste has changed in a way, or cultural shift, that I can't get through the first one. I, I just I'm so shocked <laughs> by it. Uh, which is an interesting story, isn't it? Just as a, a, an individual in their lifetime, you feel that their understanding of things. And then by the later 1800s, we have the Henry and the poems and commentaries on female writers through the ages, sort of discussing Mrs. Ben is clearly a woman of talent. It's a shame she wrote about sex so often. <laughs> she clearly had ability. It's a shame she didn't translate correctly. And you get one or two line references to Mrs. Ben sort of thrown in here and there along those lines um, until the rehabilitation begins. 1880s, 1890s, but really taken up by Rita Sackville first and Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. um, Who also thought that she didn't write very well. Yes, she ought to be pleased mm -hmm. to write. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Virginia <laughs> Woolf is a little bit slimy, isn't yeah. she? But she does, of course, Virginia Woolf is the one who all women together ought to let flowers fall upon each other back of them, for it was she who earned the right to speak their minds. And Vita writes um, a, bi a biography. It's a very slim biography and it gets many things wrong. But it, but it does raise Appa Ben back to the public consciousness and it puts her on that sort of pillar of being worthy of study again. But I, I would want to say also before the, the, the shift in taste and morality that you were talking about, immediately after her death, let's say in the 20 years maybe after her death, she continues to, to sell. Mm -hmm. So she dies in 1689. And then in 1696, a collection is brought out of her stories, and these are her stories. Um, and then in 1698, the same publisher says, funny that, I found some more. <laughs> and and, 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 and put, adds these other stories. And then in 1700, he says, you'll never guess what. I found some more. And adds some more. And that is a really, and these other stories are um, then, you know, somebody's been told to sit down and read a rule of poem and a few of the plays. Now, write a story that might have been written by, you know, someone who would. Um, but the fact that it was worth, you know, thinking you can sell a collection because it's, it's got Mrs. Ben uh, on, on the top of the page. Um, so she doesn't collapse overnight. It is about a 20 And then, you know, as I was saying earlier, you've got the Rose and the Entry of the Moon on the 
stage until the mid century. And certainly with the Rover, it has another edition about every eight to ten years. So people still buy it to read as well. And sort of interesting to me is that the, the, the text of the play through so all of those later editions until 1757, the text of the play doesn't change. Mm -hmm. So that's considerable longevity um, for, for those yeah. plays, but then this decline in reputation. Yeah. Um, and then it's not till the sort of 70s and the 80s, really, mm -hmm. that, that work starts being yeah. done. So so, so that's the kind of the, the early recovery project work. But there is still quite a lot of work to do, all right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but yeah, so, so perhaps um, before I open up um, to, to everybody else, um, do you want to tell us about the statue campaign? Um, so we've this? been touring these lovely statues for the past two weeks. Um, uh, my charity, A is for Afro, linked up with the Canterbury Commemoration Society, who have delivered other projects, other statue projects in Canterbury. And then we linked up with Professor Hobby, and we decided the time come um, to put up a good statue to someone who yeah, is a huge deal. The first professional writer in the English language is a massive deal. Never mind the other exciting elements of her life. Um, that uh, she's the grandmother of English literature to me, and needs to be raised back in Canterbury and elsewhere. She's buried in Westminster Abbey, so she was incredibly famous in her time. Mm. So when they're tearing statues down, let's put some decent statues back. There's a lot of bronze going around. Um, we had an open call for sculptors. Fifty sculptors submitted designs from all over the world, actually. And we sat down and had a great shortlist of them. And there were about eight of us, but we brought 50 down to four. Those four sculptors were commissioned to produce maquettes, small statues uh, of 40 to 50 centimeters high in bronze. This is what they produced. Here we have our four fine statues. We have Christine Charles' works. This is actually then, at the moment, that she leaves Tatterby. And goes off to London and makes her life. So here she is, 17 years old, book in hand, quill, ink pot, and a, a mask and a scroll behind her back. Um, and she's stepping forward. Next up, we've got Victoria Atkinson. Uh, Vicky doesn't often do figurative work, um, but she's produced here a strong, bold, confident, it's a sort of sexual confidence as well in this opera and she's lifting up her overskirts to reveal words written on petticoats and the underskirts of her own work a sort of delicate slipper poking out there sort of from its strong femininity um, and it's they've got the uh, Virginia Woolf quote on the base also the patination there the green patination suggesting perhaps of erosion and how memory and um, reputation can decay uh, alone next has got Meredith Bergman. Yeah, and again, if you can see her writing on the skirt here. Uh, this is Arunico. Uh, if you know her works, each of these masks around her skirt are recognisable figures from her works. Uh, there is here a snake beneath the, the, the grass, and those of you who know the poem for disappointment will know what it's being alluded to, and those who don't. I've got this to say to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think as many of you noticed earlier, as you were looking, um, so I find her face fascinating because she's inscrutable. I think she, therefore, for me, she's a woman who has learned to consider who she is, what she thinks, how she feels. Um, and she is also, of course, concealing the man's boot, mini <laughs> her skirt. That's a woman in a man world hint or again cross-dressing and gender fluidity is all in that one as well and then last we have uh, Maurice Glick. Maurice is a really established sculptor, former president of the Royal Society of Sculptors and survived Bergen Belsen as a child and here you've got a woman whose identity has been eviscerated by time and the patriarchy and you know, the fashions and morality has taken her identity away we don't know her what we do know are the works. Yeah, the books are solid. The books are solid, tangible, the leaves are always visible. Uh, she sits on her works, but we don't know her. Thank you, um, both of you, so much for being here uh, with us. And uh, thank you for coming. Thank you.